So, welcome everybody to uh, the session on household te textiles and production in and beyond Viking Age. My name is Eva Andersson Strand, and I have together with my colleagues, Charlotte Henningstjärna Jonsson and Marianne Bedler, organized this session, and we have been all looking forward to meet you, to see you, and hear what you think about our ideas. Um, I had linked all the presentations to um, one PowerPoint. We will see how that works. Um, it wasn't saved before, so I hope I had to do it very quickly now. So I hope that the correct presentation is linked to the right <laughs> title now. But we will see. Okay. The half millennium from 650 to 1150 saw a fundamental change in Scandinavian societies from central chiefdoms on the periphery of Europe to well-established Christian kingdoms with new types of economic and cult economical systems and trading structures, state formations, urban systems, and the influences of Christianity, warfare, exploring and colonizing regions outside Scandinavia, new trade, trade routes, and the modes and organization of the production were important parts of this development. And although it's well known that cloth culture had an important impact on the societal development, this perspective is yet to be fully integrated in the general discussion of the social, economic, and cultural changes that took place during this period. So most textiles produced in Viking age, they are generally considered to have been produced in a household context by women on their spare time. So we now want to start a discussion on what type of textiles that should be included in what we can call a household production. <laughs> so the first is, what is the definition of a household production? Well, we should say that the household production should solely cover the household's own needs. One should have a general knowledge and skills. The raw materials should be commonly accessible and not working full time with, the, with this production. We do have several sources in archaeology. We have the textile finds, one from Idabuk that you see here <laughs> from the harbor. But we also do have the textile tools that can tell us a lot. And the tools together with experimental archaeology can take us one step further and we can start to discuss at least suggest what type of textiles they may have been produced. We also have the iconography, uh, we have the picture stones, and we have the tapestries, and so on. And of course, using them with um, uh, the knowledge that they are recorded later and translated several times, the Icelandic sagas and other texts. But what I think is also very important to include in this discussion is so to say, the landscape of textile production. We also in need to include the resources. What technology did they use? How did the textiles look like? In order to discuss production and how the production was organized, and in that way also come to the society. Uh, the, the textiles that we talk about most in Viking Age is the textiles for clothing. And we have an idea uh, what the clothing looked like, but it's clear that um, most of the textiles that we find from Viking Age, they are actually only fragments. And we have only very few uh, parts or more complete parts of costumes preserved from this period. We do have quite a lot of mention of um, the textiles in the sources, and we should know that the people in the Viking Age, they used textile and leather and fur to cover 90% of their body. And they used textiles from the cradle to the grave. And in the sagas, we can, we can read about um, textiles, high status costumes, military costume, simple clothing, worn out garments that have been mended and used and reused, magical garments, textile given as gifts, textiles for trade and exchange. And together with the work that Ulla Mannering, among others, and Maria Nivedo have done on iconography, we can get an idea about what was a male costume and a female costume, 
a male costume with an over and under tunic, trousers, breeches, caftan, cloak, jacket, shoes, boots, etc. And a female cloth costume with linen dress, a wool dress, skirts, tunics, cloaks, jacket, shoes, boots, hairnet and veils. So, together with analysis of fragments, text, iconographic and context, we can actually discuss a little bit about the costume trends. But the fragments, they are very, very important. Because the fragments, they can tell us of the text of production in different stages. They tell us about the fiber procurement, the fiber preparation, spinning, dyeing, weaving, and finishing. And we know from the uh, textile analysis that the material that they used was flax, hemp, maybe also nettle. We have sheep wool, maybe wool from horse, and also <coughs> from goat. We find tools from fiber preparation, from flax preparation. Here you have some lean cubo in perfectly well-written Swedish. <laughs> but there should be the clubs we are used to to um, uh, break the stems and flick the pad, also perfect in Sweden. That is a shutting notch uh, to take off the wooden parts from the flex fiber. It's a very long process, and I will not go into the detail. But when it comes to the wool, the wool, they have to be shared. Yeah. The wool has to be sorted. That is also something that we see in the analysis, that the wool has been very, very carefully sorted and prepared, sometimes combed with the aid of wool combs, and then spun with spindles. And spindles and spindle whorls are one of the most common finds from Viking Age settlements. And here you have some nice examples from uh, Viking Age, and they are from Hedeby, where we also have good preservation of wood. So here you also have some excellent spindle rods that we generally don't find. We have done experiments, we have tested the spindles, testing the size of the spindles and what they actually mean for the production, um, and in order to better understand the outcome. And what we can see uh, from those tests is that with a light spindle, you can spin a long, fine, fine thread, and with a heavier spindle, you spin a coarser thread, and then you have all the variation. So it's the size of the spindle, it is the fiber material, and of course, in the end, also the spinner that dictates the outcome of what you want to produce. And this is also something that we see in the archaeological material. Here is, for example, all spindle walls I have recorded from Hyperboy. And you see they go from five gram up to quite heavy. So here we got an idea about that they have, they have produced a wide range of textiles. The dye analysis also tell us that they have dyed textiles with different types of plants. For example, blue with bode and red with madder. Furthermore, the small, small fragments can tell us something about the weaving techniques they knew. Plain weave, such as tabby, but also different types of twill and other types of weaves like brocade, tapestry and pine. We know that they have been working and um, working on being weaving on the warp weighted loom. And in Viking Age, we see an increasing use of this type of loom because we find so many loom weights. Uh, just for this setup, we needed 60 loom weights. The cloth is 60 centimeter wide. It's a twill. And again, we can see that the small loom weights, they are more convenient to use to one type of fabrics, while the heavier loom weights is convenient to used for another type of fabric. We have a tendency to underestimate how much raw material and time consume, consumption that was needed to produce textiles just for clothing. Here we have done some calculation. calculation. It's based on one male costume weighing around four kilos. For this, in a very coarse quality, and this is coarser than Viking Age textiles in general, but we said 10 threads per centimeter, you need 30,000 meters of yarn. And this is equal to 14 square meters of uh, claw, uh, coarse cloth. It would take them 32 days to prepare the fibers, 60 days to spin all the yarn needed, two days to set up the loom, approximately 28 days to weave. So around one 
122 days if you are working 10 hours a day it will take to produce this very coarse textile. But what about other types of textiles? So far I've just talked about clothing for costumes. We also know that there was a need of textiles for furnishing. Tapestries, pillows and mattresses, curtains, bed linens and tablecloth. Are these textiles also produced in a household context? What about luxury textiles? Tablet woven bands, silk applications, embroideries, etc. And then I will say, no sales, no Viking Age. If they couldn't produce the sails, it would have been quite impossible to sail around on the North Sea and further on. And the need of sail was quite substantial Eric Anderson has calculated that in 1030, one million square meters of sails were needed in the old Danish kingdom. And I have calculated for the large ship. Uh, my question was how many textiles were necessary and used on a ship similar to the Danish large ship with 32 oarsmen. So just to produce the clothing, the sail, and some tents, they needed 410 kilos of raw material, which would take more than 24 years for one person to make, working 10 hours a day. And then another 60 kilos were needed for a sail, another 2.6 years. And if you then also needed tent, you, uh, even one small tent, which had another 30 kilos of raw materials and 1.3 years to make. So, this has taken up a lot of time to produce the sales for um, and produce the clothing for the trade, the war and the warfare. And could this be included in the household production? So the aim in this session is to explore the variety and function of household textiles and the production in the Viking Age. So what can we consider to be a household production and what goes beyond it? This was my short introduction.